Good evening and welcome. My name is Greg Albanus, and I serve on the executive committee of NYU Stonewall 50. NYU Stonewall 50 Look Back, Move Forward is both a celebration and a commemoration. And we decided over a year and a half ago that we would look back at these past 50 years in four distinct lenses. The AIDS epidemic, media perception, how did we move from boys in the band to Will and Grace, trans equality and rights, and of course marriage equality. I'm proud to say in the last six months and in the next two months, New York University has done more than any other American university, and I can honestly say than any university in the world commemorating this important uh, milestone. Let me just uh, share with you our shopping list. We've produced four exhibitions, all of which are now at Washington Square. We've published three books, produced 30 performances at the Scarborough Center of the Performing Arts, a 30-minute documentary oral history video, which will be previewed here in Washington on June 28th. The Tisch School of the Arts uh, produced a three-act opera called Stonewall the Opera that will actually be performed at the Stonewall Inn during Pride Month. 30 lectures, organized community service initiatives, LGBTQ tours of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, walking tours of Walt Whitman's New York, three film festivals, and last but not least, last night we had the requisite drag bingo. <laughs> These events are not taking place not only in New York, but also here in Washington, D.C., but also in our global centers, in Prague, Berlin, Florence, Tel Aviv, Shanghai, London, Paris, and Sydney. I encourage you to log on to our website, nyu.edu slash stonewall50, to learn about some of the events that we've done and read the timeline that NYU played a very important role, not only in our proximity to the Stonewall Inn, but in furthering LGBTQ rights for all Americans. Uh, a special thanks to our co-sponsors tonight, the National LGBTQ Task Force, and a special shout out to a dear friend and colleague, Tom McIntyre, that provides leadership uh, for the NYU Stonewall events here in Washington and the NYU Bradamus Center. Tonight's um, topic is somewhat dear to me. Um, I'm Greek Orthodox, and we celebrated Eastern Orthodox Easter last night. And we, in fact, sat across the table cracking eggs and eating lamb and talking about this very topic, so I'm very curious to see how, in fact, uh, this turns out tonight. It's a pleasure for me to introduce tonight's moderator, the Reverend Naomi Washington Leaphart, who serves as Faith Work Director for the National LGBTQ Task Force. In addition to that and her responsibility, she's an adjunct professor at Villanova University, where she teaches religious studies and theology. And most important, she's a proud mom to Sophia, a very curious fifth grader who I'm told holds a future Oscar in her stars. So without further ado, thank you all for coming. Good evening, everybody. I just want to begin by setting the tone and giving some context to our conversation tonight, specifically about the faith community and its uh, role in and response to um, what was set in motion um, in part by the Stonewall riot. So first, I, I just want us to have a moment of silence briefly. I don't know how you feel, but I'm feeling the need to just pause and reflect about the last week, the last month, what we're holding, what's on our minds and hearts, loss after loss after loss. So let's just pause. As I think about what happened there on Christopher Street 50 years ago, I think about the fact that on that night 
in that place, in that bar, the folks who had gathered, the folks who had found sanctuary there, whose sanctuary was interrupted by violence, by antagonism, by disrespect, said, not today. They were fed up. Yes, they had encountered this violence before, this antagonism before, this disrespect before, this dehumanization before, but there was something about that night, that constellation of people. And the attitude was one of resistance. No, no more, enough, enough. And I think about that as an act of faith. No, it wasn't a faith community. Um, spirituality wasn't explicit or prominent. It wasn't worship service, but it was an act of faith. Why? Because faith is fundamentally about saying, this isn't the way things have to be. I believe that we can be the best version of ourselves, that the world can be better. That's, to me, what faith is about. It's about invoking the power of the collective, of the community, of the transcendent to remake the world, to do justice, to repair breaches, to restore joy. And so it makes sense that we're here tonight to talk about Stonewall and faith and religious community because that act of resistance was, in my view, an act of faith. And that act of faithful resistance, whether in religious communities proper or not, continues through to this moment. And so we're going to hear from guests who remember guests who um, are standing here today inspired by those who were there that night at Stonewall. The guests today will talk about how faith communities themselves have needed to be transformed. It's an ongoing work. They've needed to be transformed by the revolution began that day 50 years ago. And people of faith have also been doing the revolution to make sure that all people, LGBTQ people included, can live with dignity and delight. So I stand here as a person of faith, completely inspired by our guests and Acknowledging the fact that I stand inspired by those who are surrounding us now in that great cloud of witnesses, those who were there that night in Stonewall. So let me tell you about our guests. We will be hearing from Aruj Arshad, who is the Director of International LGBTQ Youth Health and Rights Programs at Advocates for Youth. And in that role, Aruj builds the capacity of organizations working on sexual and reproductive health rights and justice in the global south. She's also designed a project that addresses the reproductive and sexual health needs of Muslim youth in particular. Aruj is the co-founder of the Muslim Alliance for Sexual and Gender Diversity which addresses the intersectional impact of Islamophobia, homophobia, and transphobia. And that's where I had the wonderful opportunity to meet Aruj for the first time, engaged in that work with Masjid. Aruj has presented at conferences domestically and internationally on Capitol Hill, at the State Department, at the National Press Club. Uh, and Aruj is involved in civic leadership. She's on the board of the Arcus Center for Social Justice and Leadership and the Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice. So we're delighted to hear from Arouge. 
We'll also be hearing from our guest, Bishop Yvette Flunder, who is the founding senior pastor of the City of Refuge United Church of Christ and the presiding bishop of the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries. She's a third generation preacher, uh, is a scholar, has lectured and been affiliate faculty at several institutions, including Yale, Bright Divinity School, and Pacific School of Religion. And she is the author of Where the Edge Gathers, a theology of homiletic radical inclusion. We'll also be hearing from Ariel Gingold, who is the Deputy Washington Director of Bend the Ark Jewish Action. For more than 10 years, Ariel Gingold has advocated for social justice and progressive politics in the DC area. And at Bend the Ark, uh, she represents the organization on Capitol Hill. We'll also hear from Bishop Jean Robinson, who is the Vice President of Religion at the Chautauqua Institution. Bishop Robinson was elected Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire on June 7th, 2003, after having served almost 30 years in that diocese, and he is the first openly gay man to be elected Bishop in the high church traditions of Christendom. Bishop Robinson has been invited by President Obama to give the invocation at the inaugural ceremony at the Lincoln Memorial in 2009. And Bishop Robinson is also an author of two books, In the Eye of the Storm, Swept to the Center by God, and God Believes in Love, Straight Talk About Gay Marriage. I'm delighted to say that my path has intersected with each of our guests, and so I know we're in for a treat, the wisdom embodied by these folks is off the charts. Moderating our discussion tonight will be Drew Goins, who is an assistant editor um, in, a, in, the, in opinions at the Washington Post. So without further ado, here are our guests. Let's receive them. Welcome everybody to tonight's event. We'll give everyone a second to get settled. So as you saw, tonight's event is called the LGBTQ Rights Revolution in America's Churches, Synagogues, and Mosques. And I think that word revolution is particularly apt for what's going on right now because it's a bit of a coup, right? Given the history. Um, I think broadly in the United States, in a religious and non-religious setting, we've certainly seen a pretty swift advancement of LGBTQ rights and, accept and acceptance. You look at public opinion, you look at Supreme Court cases for the time being, at least. Um, it seems that the battle's not entirely over, but we've certainly made a lot of headway. Where in that revolution do you think we are in these sacred spiritual spaces? That we'll start with you. Well, first of all, I am grateful for the progress that we have made. Uh, and I'm, I have seen the arc of justice do this before in terms of moving way out on justice issues and doing really, really well. And along comes a situation, a circumstance that seeks to pull us back to some degree. I don't think we'll ever go back to where we've been. Uh, and I think that we're going to have to concretize and solidify some of our recent victories. I also know what it means for, uh, uh, to be a part of a civil rights and justice rights organization and civil rights and justice rights movement during a time when those newly won civil rights and justice rights are being used to go after the people who lost when we won or feel that they lost when we won. If you want to get their votes, the thing that you want to do then is go after the newly <laughs> won right. justice rights of a group of people who have been marginalized. And in this case, by uh, faith groups, marginalized by issues of race, mm -hmm. 
marginalized by issues of class, by uh, issues of uh, patriarchy. Mm -hmm. They're just certain, certain groups of people. And when you want those votes, you want to go after the newly won victories in a group of people. However, they will not win. Ultimately, it will not work. Mm. In the end, I, I believe that justice will prevail. So you go right ahead. <laughs> Hard not to clap for that. Um, you so said, can we jump in? Yeah, go for right? it, please. Um, I would also, uh, I, I'm the old guy here, right? Um, I go, I go kind of crazy when people talk about how much progress we've made in the last 10 or 15 years as if nothing happened before that mm -hmm. to lay the groundwork for that or that we don't stand on uh, uh, the shoulders of a lot of uh, matriarchs and patriarchs. Um, so um, I was just uh, looking up a, a friend of mine, Robert Wood, who died uh, last August, uh, 95 years old, uh, was a UCC minister and in 1960 wrote a book called Christ and the Homosexual. In 1965, he marched in his collar uh, with a group um, in Philadelphia, and they marched every year. It became, uh, uh, the event became known as the Annual Reminder, uh, and they, they were all just nicely dressed. You know, the, the lesbians were all in like little Robin, you know, Robin blue suits and the men had ties and they were doing really dangerous things, right? And I think it's also important to remember that that's, that was the height of the civil rights movement or at least the, you know, the, the really super active part. Uh, all of that before Stonewall. And I would say that uh, we, we could not have had a movement except for the civil rights movement, for, primarily for African Americans, but, but for, for all, and the women's movement, because homophobia at its, at its base is, is just another form of misogyny, mm -hmm. right? So I don't think our movement could have happened without standing on the shoulders of, of the women's movement and the uh, civil rights movement of the of the 60s and and so I think it's it, especially as we're in this 50th anniversary right that was um, that was 60 years ago that that book was written right mm -hmm. and uh, so we stand on the shoulders of a lot of people and a lot of those people in both of those movements were in churches and synagogues and mosques mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, religious people I think have been involved in that all along and um, I would say for LGBTQ Muslims, uh, we, we can't talk about progress until we also talk about the Islamophobia and the anti-Muslim hatred, especially right now, um, especially in the way it's been used to uh, LGBTQ people, for example, have been used um, against Muslims as if to say that there aren't LGBTQ Muslims and Muslim allies. Um, when we look at the Muslim ban and how the first um, executive orders language talked about protecting Americans from uh, Muslims who are anti-LGBTQ as if this administration is an anti-LGBTQ. So for me, it's this larger context of how do we look at how Islamophobia affects LGBTQ Muslims and how we're um, invisible in both LGBTQ and Muslim spaces. And that, I think, is a big struggle for us still. Mm -hmm. the, Jean, you were, uh, the word that comes to mind when you're talking about the, all the work that these faith communities did during the civil rights movement is prophetic. That, this was, that these people were speaking out before there was widespread public support for LGBTQ rights and advancement. And there is a very, very rich history of that. So my question now is, is what does that sort of prophecy, what does that advocacy look like today when we have made such great strides thanks to our, our forefathers and foremothers and parents? Um, Ariel, could you speak to that? Sure, happy to. Um, and really pleased to be sitting alongside these um, you know, luminaries in the field and, and in this movement. So it's really good to be with you all. Um, I think today, uh, you know, as we're on the cusp of hopefully passing the Equality Act through the House, mm -hmm. which will be a landmark civil rights, comp pretty comprehensive civil rights protections for LGBTQ Americans, um, and 
uh, you know, we now have marriage equality. I think um, it's important that we're always marking how far we've come and also really cognizant of where we still need to go. And I think in that regard, um, adoption and foster care mm -hmm. is one of the biggest and not well enough talked about mm -hmm. um, issues. Um, it's been a, a particular focus of my and, and Ben the Ark's work. Um, and I want to lift up a, a piece that my colleague back at Israel, who works in uh, Ben the Ark's New York office, wrote um, in a publication called The Forward, a, a Jewish publication, after uh, the birth of her child, uh, her, her wife um, uh, gave birth to their child, uh, of her experience of having living in New York State, living under legal marriage equality, having to adopt her own child mm -hmm. and go through second parent adoption. Um, we've come so far and still, um, and the Equality Act will be a huge, huge step um, and it, it may not address all of the issues in the foster care space today um, that lead to discrimination both against kids in care mm -hmm. because of their real or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity um, or against prospective parents. And it also keeps us from getting the widest pool of parents that 400,000 kids in foster care need because LGBTQ parents or single people either don't come forward because if the state doesn't have explicit protections, it's down to what caseworker you get. Mm -hmm. uh, or there are particular states that have specific foster care, what they call conscience clause discriminations. And so that's where our faith is being abused. It's being turned into a license to discriminate. Uh, religious freedom is being co-opted in this way. Mm -hmm. And so we have, I think it's about seven or eight states that are using religious freedom to, to prefer the faith of child welfare providers over the needs of a kid in care. And, and that's just not right. So I think that's one area that we really need to keep fighting. Uh, one of the things that I, I'm reminded of um, out of the African American experience, w which I've, uh, I've learned so much from, um, and, and one of the realities is that just because the Jim Crow laws came off the books didn't mean racism was at an end. And I want us to keep reminding ourselves that, that the, the, at the federal level, the Equality Act, absolutely we need it. Mm -hmm. And it will not necessarily change hearts and minds, right? Mm -hmm. So there will still be lots of work to do, although um, amongst religious people, uh, we now have a majority of every single religious um, uh, flavor in America, a majority are LGBTQ positive, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, now that is an astounding mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. uh, never mind that the hierarchies in most of those places are not, but the people uh, in the pews, in the pews are. The other thing is, um, just in terms of being prophetic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so white gay men are still white, and they're still men, right? <laughs> And uh, one, of the, one of the great um, disappointments in my life is you'd think going through the experience of being gay, you'd like learn something maybe. Uh, but the, it is astounding to me how many people uh, look, apparently have learned nothing and are just happy as a clam to be racist or misogynist or, or whatever is, you know, ism you want to you wanna pick. So I, I think we have to be careful not to let ourselves off the hook uh, just because we've been uh, targeted um, in, in one oppression uh, not to participate in others. Um, and so we, we've got to do that work um, instead of arguing over where to go to brunch on Sunday. After church, <laughs> exactly. I might. That's good. <laughs> the I think that lack of solidarity gene leaves our marginalized communities open to being pitted against one another. We were talking about this in the green room before the panel tonight, um, and had some really stimulating discussion. Could could someone touch on that? Well, without question, uh, we are pitted against each other, and. What is interesting to me is that shifts and changes that have happened, usually around issues of justice, in many cases, to my chagrin, 
did not emanate from communities of faith. What ended up happening is that it emanated uh, when women got the right to vote, when we talked a lot about uh, the shifts in civil rights uh, in the nation for the, for the predominant race uh, population, uh, when we talked about um, the importance of our borders and such like, it came from community activists doing a lot, a lot of work, and even people in the black community who were favored, like Martin Luther King, who we attribute a lot of uh, the credit for what happened in, in during the civil rights movement in the late 50s and the 60s. It had a lot to do with uh, his pulling away from, uh, for people who don't know, uh, Martin Luther King was a part of the National Baptist Convention and uh, started talking about uh, social justice and the importance of social justice. And he was excommunicated, essentially, from the largest African-American gathering of uh, churches on uh, the National Baptist Convention, and which hence was the creation of the Progressive National Baptist uh, Conference. Uh, and they had a big fight, one of those big parking lot fights, uh, because of the concerns that he had about justice. So he didn't become wonderful to the black community, uh, really, until he died. And when he died, then we iconized him. But he was resisted. So a lot of the shifts and changes that needed to happen um, did not come through faith. It came through activists. And we faith folks kind of caught on to it <laughs> later after it become, became part of the populist realities. And so to your point, there are still issues that are used um, in and around uh, issues of faith to divide us. And what is one, one of the brilliant realities against justice in our present atmosphere is uh, this, this uh, concept of finding everything that, when you're trying to create a voter base, everything that, for instance, the faith people want. They don't want abortion. They don't want the gay people. They don't want the browning of the nation. They don't want women to have the right to choose. You know, they, don't, they just don't want. And everything that they don't want, then this atmosphere says, and we agree with that. And then we'll add two or three other things, like guns. And then before you know it, the planks have all been set out. And folks are agreeing, who are people of faith, to things that would seem to be so incongruous with being a person of faith. But they are agreeing for the whole plank. So essentially, I'll throw the gays out. I kind of like the gays. But I'll toss the gays if I can get anti-abortion on the plank. And I kind of like the blacks and the browns. But if the blacks and the browns keep having babies and there's a low birth rate for white women, we're going to be in trouble in this country. So I'm going to be against abortion. Essentially, I don't agree with all of it, but most of it fits mm -hmm. what it is that works for me if I'm a middle class white man in America. Mm -hmm. It works for me. So we have been pitted as black people and people of color against one another to vote at times uh, if I can just say this, when Proposition 8 was happening in California, and people said, well, Obama's on the ticket, so black people are going to vote for gay people's right to marriage. But they didn't know that the Mormon church and the Catholic church was going to fight so hard. And people went to the voting booth, and they voted for Barack, but the plank that was for the church was against abortion and against gay. And they voted strongly for one thing and not the other, which is incredible. Shows us the ways in which faith and politics working together can incredibly divide or incredibly enrich. I think that right, right now, faith has been utilized powerfully Faith has been utilized powerfully, and I'll, I'll say that I believe in some ways faith in our country right now, in terms of its leadership, has abdicated its moral authority in a couple of ways. But they're serious ways, and ways that we need to recognize, and ways that those of us who are faith people need to push back against. Faith needs to get in the front now, and stop getting in the back and being carried. I think also when so many minority faith communities and 
faith communities, um, communities of color mm -hmm. are being targeted um, for violence. Um, yeah. While so many of us are also doing the, the kind of intra-community work that, that you were just talking about, we're also struggling with the inter-community solidarity work. Mm -hmm. um, for a little while now at Ben the Ark, we've been really trying to uh, focus on the message that we're only safe in solidarity. And so every time someone comes after a synagogue, every time a politician, unfortunately of predominantly one party, mm -hmm. makes a, an anti-Semitic remark or mm -hmm. would level charges of anti-Semitism, unfortunately predominantly of progressive women of color, leaders of color, um, I, we feel a responsibility to say, and it's not just us. It's the mm -hmm. same people who are targeting black churches in Louisiana, yeah, exactly. who are the same person who attacked the synagogue in Poway, tried to firebomb a mosque not far away. It is the same white nationalism mm -hmm. that is threatening all of our communities and, and threatening LGBTQ individuals, both because LGBTQ individuals are in our churches and our synagogues and our mosques and our people of color and our Jews, and also because we know homophobia is rampant among white, white nationalists because mm -hmm. We are, in their minds, all inferior. And I think the other thing that we're trying to, um, to remind ourselves and remind each other is that one of the things that they're trying to do is divide us. Mm -hmm. and we saw this um, a few weeks ago in Congress in a hearing that was supposed to be focused on the white nationalism that is threatening all of mm -hmm. us. And instead, the Republican members brought someone who wanted to instead try to make out Muslims to be the enemy mm -hmm. and who wanted to try to pit our communities against each other and make us out to be enemies. But we know who the real threat is. We know that we are only safe together and that we are not each other's enemy. And we know who we are fighting and that we are stronger when we're fighting together against the common threat. Absolutely. Also, I would just, I would just uh, throw in here that I think we need to uh, stop calling and treating these folks like lone wolves yeah. Yeah. because yeah. they are a community. It yeah. may be online, but they are feeding each other, revving each other up, uh, increasing everyone's hatred and so on. Yeah. And, and we just keep thinking like it's, it's just one apple in the barrel. But uh, all of those apples uh, come from the same place, yeah. or uh, generally speaking. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Ruj, I think you were... Yeah, so I think what I see within uh, how Muslims are treated in, in this hearing, for example, considered always suspect, even if the, uh, you know, this um, person had lost three kids um, to, to this um, white nationalist. And I remember when the news broke, it had been 24 hours mm. and no one had picked it up. It, it was called a parking dispute yeah. for 24 hours before. So even in that, you know, mus what happens to Muslims, it, it's horrifying. Um, but what I wanted to also talk about is, uh, was what happened after Orlando yeah. when, um, you know, suddenly LGBTQ Muslims who, you know, it's, it is hard mm -hmm. for us to find support in our communities, in our Muslim communities. And it's also hard for us to find support in LGBT communities because a lot of times people say, well, why, would you, why do you want to be around a terrorist religion? Or why do you want to uh, be in a religion that hates you? Mm -hmm. Or why are you wearing the hijab? Like the secular religious divide that uh, is really affects Muslims as well. And so suddenly LGBTQ Muslims were in the spotlight having to absolutely defend Islam in this moment when we felt like it was being used uh, to to attack our own communities mm -hmm. you know one community against the other and it was heartbreaking because we were mourning as well for all the lives that were lost uh, but then also having to defend our entire religion mm -hmm. um, and then when um, Trump started talking about the Muslim ban as a as a response to what happened in Orlando and then just seeing the rhetoric uh, that has continued um, it's it's absolutely heartbreaking and it's very strategic on on their part Jean you, were, Jean, you were talking earlier about how frustrating it can be to have all this support within congregations or within communities for LGBTQ total acceptance and be foiled by church hierarchy or hierarchy within the religion. How, how do we continue to advocate for change? How do we work around that when change seems like it's not coming, whether that's sacred resistance or schism in some cases, or 
third spaces, which are so critical. Um, you're, I think, uniquely positioned to speak on this, given the Anglican realignment that is still ongoing, right? Sure. Um, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for the Roman Catholic Church, but I do in this one way, mm. which is that the, um, if the hierarchy, namely the Pope, uh, changes his mind about this, uh, which he hasn't, by the way, uh, he's just hinted right. at a different tone. Yeah. Nothing has changed about the teaching of the church. And until that happens, it's, it's not really changed. But uh, if, if a change happens uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, it has to work in Sri Lanka and mm -hmm. Peru and everywhere. It's not just American Catholics, right? Uh, but most of the rest of us are dealing more with a uh, I mean, the Methodists have their problems That's with right. that and, and our <laughs> Anglican <laughs> communion. Um, but so I, I think some of this is going to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. And here's why. Because some of us are making a pretty good case for God's love for all of God's children whether they be LGBTQ, whether they be uh, people of other faiths or whatever, that God loves all of God's children. That sounds pretty good to a kid in a mega church um, uh, whose services sometimes seem more like a political rally than a, than a church service. Mm -hmm. and, and while those places used to be growing, they are hemorrhaging young people mm -hmm. like crazy and the number one reason that they give for leaving is LGBT issues. And, and the reason is they have LGBTQ friends. And they know that what being, what's being told them is just bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, nobody wants to be a part of an organization th that does that. It's not unlike people you know, uh, giving up their country club memberships when Jews and blacks couldn't be a part of it. So I think. In some, in some ways, they're going to come toward us yeah. um, if we continue being uh, a, a loving and welcoming place. Mm -hmm. My fear, uh, as a, as a uh, you know, religion's my business, right? Uh, my fear is that they, they don't go to anything, yeah. That's right. right? Because it fits in with a, this general distrust of institutions of all kinds, mm -hmm. um, including religious ones. And so I think for a, a lot of younger people uh, who are leaving those churches, they're thinking, you know, this is just another instance of, of institutions letting us down, uh, not telling us the truth, and, and not, not supporting us in who we are. Uh, but, but I do think um, that it's, it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, and my guess is, you know how, you remember how it was at 1978, the, uh, the head Mormon? Uh, talk to God, and God had changed his mind about black people? Absolutely. Remember? I'm, I'm predicting, and you can just quote me on this, I'm predicting that the prophet will receive a message from God that God has changed his mind yeah. or her mind yeah. about LGBTQ people, Absolutely. right? Because, you know, there are more LGBTQ kids on the streets of, of uh, Salt Lake City than anywhere else in America. Um, so uh, percentage-wise, and so I, th I think we're going to start seeing uh, some of these um, institutions uh, change their minds, not necessarily for, for the best reasons, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I don't care, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, so I, so I, think, um, I think what we need to do is, is to keep making the case yeah. uh, uh, that one can be um, LGBTQ and be a religious person. Mm -hmm. uh, for all too long, we thought those uh, couldn't be in the same sentence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, while that's changing, where, where are these people who are yearning for a faith connection to go if they are not welcome in traditionally um, mosques, churches, synagogues? Are there, are there places for them to go in the meantime? I will say, I, I think, as the, the Jew on the panel, I feel like I'm, I'm sitting in a, in a bit more of a privileged position in that regard. I, I was reminding myself of the sort of timeline of um, synagogues leadership becoming um, affirming. Mm -hmm. um, and it was in uh, 
1972 that the first LGBT synagogue in the world actually opened um, in Los Angeles. Uh, it's a congregation Beth uh, Haverim Chadashim. Um, and so I certainly feel privileged to be, to have been raised in a denomination um, that, uh, that was one of the first to, not the first, but one of to ordain LGBT individuals and um, affirm same-sex marriage as being religiously and ethically and morally as valid. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we still have work to do in our community, right? So, so I would hope that every synagogue um, in the country, and, and there is some diversity in, in uh, Orthodox synagogues, not all are affirming, um, but of the other, there are four major Jewish denominations in the US, reform, reconstructing, <laughs> reconstructing and conservative, um, are all affirming and or ordaining LGBTQ individuals. We also still have a lot of work to do. Um, and so I want to lift up the work of my friends at an organization called Keshet, which is doing a lot of really important intra-community work, um, particularly educating our community on how to be more affirming of trans individuals. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of really great important work with summer camps um, in particular, both with other campers and with parents and making sure that everybody can be an equal participant in everything that our community has to offer. There's a couple of things that I would like to add. One is that uh, there are a number of people who are emerging from the historic communities of faith in the African American community. Uh, there, we have a network of churches called the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries that is made up of folks who are Methabapticostal people, as we call ourselves, <laughs> from those traditions uh, who uh, enjoy the culture of black church, the sound. We like, uh, you know, a B3 organ and a drum set and, and uh, clapping on the two and the four and all of that. That's a part of our reality. Um, with uh, sans the, the complicated uh, theologies that we emerged from that not only uh, dealt a death blow in many ways to LGBT people, but also to the leadership of women and uh, also the, uh, the importance of the environment. There are a number of things that I could say. We had a strong apocalyptic eschatology, essentially. And if Jesus is coming back on Friday, why would we care about clean water? You know, it, why would we vote? Mm -hmm. And so uh, moving away from those realities to something that is more uh, consistent with justice in a number of ways, but simultaneously also keeping the culture, that has always been the challenge. Right. Where there was justice, the culture was so difficult to um, organically connect to. So that's a part of it. But there are other people that are part, still continue to be part of the traditional churches that we came up in. And they have a subculture. And I have to tell you something about what I know about black gay folks in church. That you can be and often are in a conservative environment, but there's a whole other something going on. And uh, folks are very skilled at it. To some degree, I, I do find it problematic because it is a nicely furnished closet, but it's still a closet. And I think closets are for brooms. I don't care <laughs> how nicely furnished they are. So I think that it's, it's very important that we do take the pioneering challenge of establishing something else that is also clearly uh, affirming of all people. And then finally, I think in regard to the new, uh, fastest uh, growing religion in our country is no religion. The non-religious percentage has far out distance now the growth, as my brother Gene has said, the growth of what is happening in our churches. I say that both to my joy and my chagrin as a practitioner of faith. But other does not mean that it's bad. The, the young folks just don't know exactly what to call it yet. They know what they're not going to do. They're not altogether clear about what they are going to do. And that is not a bad place to be because it opens young people and younger people up to the possibilities of something that will emerge from, evolve from what has not been helpful to something that will be helpful. And I'm watching them and I'm listening to them and I'm also in many ways being led by them because they're not afraid. <laughs> yeah. 
And most of us who have had old time religion, <laughs> we still have the vestiges of what holds religion in place. And that is fear, fear and tradition. They don't have to be bothered with either of those to some degree. So I am watching them. It's refreshing to watch um, in this time. And I'm very hopeful. I have, I have confidence in you, sir. And folks, on and, yeah, and folks like you. And then you got the gay socks and everything. It's just so wonderful. <laughs> All things are possible with God and good. Uh, when I first moved to Washington here a few years ago, I, I came down to... Uh, become a, a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, which is about as secular as an organization as you can get. Um, I, even I was impressed that they hired me. Um, so we had, um, I worked on the LGBT team. Um, Sarah McBride was on our team, and, and her uh, boyfriend uh, was also trans, right? Um, so make a very long story short, very suddenly, uh, he got cancer. He was given two weeks to live. And so they called me up and said, would you marry us b before Andy dies? So I did that. It was amazing, right? So uh, Neera Tandon, the head of, of uh, CAP, came to me and said, uh, she had been at the funeral. She said, uh, would you do something? for us? <laughs> I'm like, you want to say a little more about that? Uh, she's like, uh, everybody in, you know, they're mostly 20 and 30 somethings except for the higher ups, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and Andy was 28, I think. So most of them hadn't lost a grandparent yet, never mind a parent, never mind someone their own age. Mm -hmm. And so it raised those religious questions, right? Who am I, where am I going, why am I here, what am I gonna do with the time I've got, all that. Um, and so Nero wanted me to do something. Um, and through that experience, um, oddly, I, I became a little bit of a chaplain at that place. Mm -hmm. Because th they thought I was a pretty cool guy, but they couldn't understand why in the world I would be associated with, with organized religion. Mm -hmm. um, and they were pretty curious about what made me tick. Mm -hmm. um, and what I learned from that experience was that, uh, what we all know, which is that uh, when people leave churches or synagogues or mosques, uh, they don't leave their spiritual needs yes. behind. Mm -hmm. They just don't have that way to meet them anymore. And, they're, and as, as you were saying, that um, they're, they're trying to um, uh, figure out uh, new ways of doing that. Um, and, and so we, we, you know, at CAP, we did, this, we did this service. And what I said to them was like, OK, so we're, like, we're all adults. Uh, I'm going to pray some Christian prayers, because Andy was Christian, and that's what we prayed at his funeral. But, in your own minds, do whatever kind of translating you need to do, uh, because um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, every person here has a spirituality. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, you're the only one who knows what that is. Mm -hmm. uh, so you take my words, or this music, or whatever, and make it work for you. And you know, for a moment, that incredibly secular place became this very, very yeah. spiritual yeah. place. Yeah. And, and I think that's the challenge for us. The, the thing that worries me is that I don't know that all of them have um, uh, people to, to go to who have kind of been on this journey for a long time. Uh, for some of us, that would be ordained people, but certainly not necessarily, uh, but uh, sort of companions along that, uh, that route. And I don't know how we make ourselves available, uh, uh, portray ourselves, or be trustworthy enough for them to want to talk to. Arud, you mentioned how difficult it is to have a lack of support in formal Islam, so I'm wondering if you could speak to the existence of these non-traditional spiritual outlets in Islam. Um, yeah, so I was just reflecting in, um, for what folks were saying regarding access to spiritual and religious spaces and especially for young people, and it's true for Muslims as well, a lot of young people are feeling disconnected from the mosque. Um, what's um, interesting around the Muslim identities in, in this country, and I, 
in general in the West is there, it's also a political identity. So there's, uh, because of uh, being a minority and on top of it being a very much hated minority. Um, and so there is also all kinds of spaces that are uh, happening that are cultural, that are political, that are bringing mu Muslims on a, a, a wide continuum of um, identities, which is really exciting. Um, What's also happening is that there are these, as you were saying, third spaces. These are spaces that are organized outside of the structure of the mosque, um, and they are more open to talking about LGBTQ issues. And so, for example, in Columbia Heights last year um, and previous years during uh, during Ramadan, um, there are there's a prayer space that um, is organized by young folks, and they were very open to talking about a non. Um, the, you know, the spaces are gendered, right? Like, if you're gonna go into a Muslim space that is not LGBTQ, uh, most likely they'll be gendered, which obviously is really difficult for our LGBTQ community, for specifically for trans and gender non-conforming people. And so we had this conversation around how to make a middle space where people could go and pray. Mm -hmm. um, and so these, some of these are small, small changes, but they can make a huge impact in the long term where people are feeling like they can go to a space in the neighborhood and pray with everyone else, uh, which is a huge, uh, desire for a lot of people in the community. Um, there are also spaces that are, are uh, being organized that are by LGBTQ people, um, and they look they are cultural spaces, but they're also religious spaces. So, for example, in Chicago, there is a um, gr uh, it's it's called Masjid Al Rabia. It's um, led by a, a trans uh, Muslim woman, mm -hmm. and that is a mosque space um, for LGBTQ people and other folks who are also affected by not being part of um, or not or being stigmatized by mainstream understandings of theology within Islam. Um, and uh, so those are some of the ways that you know it's happening. And then the group that I used to be part of, the Muslim Alliance for Sexual and Gender Diversity, organizes uh, retreats that brings about 100 LGBTQ Muslims a year. And um, their, their mixed gender spaces um, uh, prayer spaces, which is all this really powerful, you know, so we make sure that it's not just cisgender men leading the prayer, um, calling the call to prayer, that traditionally roles that have only been uh, for cisgender men because of the patriarchal understandings of the Quran and of Islam. So, um, so we're we're, we see our work as part of a bigger gender liberation work. Um, and lastly, I would say that, so I'm part of the Sunni sect, which is the majority sect within the world. Um, it's decentralized. So in some ways it's great because I have a direct relationship to Allah. Um, in other ways it's harder because there isn't an organized leadership to kind of target. Um, but within the Smiley community, which is a, a, a minority sect, um, they've done a lot of amazing work, especially after Orlando. There was LGBT Smileys who wrote a letter to their leadership and there has been some incredible changes that have happened um, within the within their trainings. They're doing LGBTQ affirming trainings. They, they are really, uh, in, being very inclusive within their community. Um, the issue is that they, uh, because they're considered, uh, because they're a minority and a lot of times not considered Muslim, unfortunately, by um, people, by mainstream Sunni uh, communities, that what they're doing is then completely um, just not validated, which is really unfortunate. Um, but that is the community within Islam that is doing some really incredible work. It sounds like my church needs to step it up. <laughs> In all seriousness, I, I, I attend a very progressive church here in Washington, D.C., and, and something that I, I recognize there is that it is very easy for us advocates who think of ourselves as progressives to get very much in the mindset of we've got it all down, mm -hmm. that we don't have to do more work to keep integrating within our own communities, right? Um, so before, it looks like we're about to get questions, but um, uh, as a last question for you all, for me, um, I'm wondering uh, about inclusive language in particular. Mm -hmm. um, I think about, I mean, Hebrew, it's difficult for something, it's difficult to have a pronoun for, for non-gender conforming folks in Hebrew when so much of the liturgy of Judaism or the Book of Common Prayer, changing language for God, striking all gendered language, be mitzvahs, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you all could speak to, to that because it's, it's such, it seems like such a small thing, but it is an area that can make all the difference in whether someone feels welcome in a place of worship. I, I, I wish I'd uh, remembered to look up some of the folks who are doing some really good work creating um, Hebrew liturgy that is non-gendered, mm -hmm. but it's happening. Um, I, I grew up in the Reform denomination and grew up pretty early on with uh, non-gendered 
pronouns for God in our English liturgy, but you know we still Hebrew is a language that has genders for nouns because apparently nouns have genders, um, and so you know like the the English may have changed, but the Hebrew did not, and there are are people who are um, doing really good work creating inclusive language. I do think that, unfortunately, whether we're talking in Hebrew or in English, grammar is too often used as a cop-out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it might sound weird to your ear, but like they add new words to the dictionary all the time. We adapt. Mm -hmm. AP style changes. And so I think it's just a matter of continuing to change comfort levels yeah. and, um, and to model both what inclusive language can look like and explicitly say why it's necessary to make the connection for people. Um, and I think it, it's possible and, and the trade-off is being inclusive, so why not? I, I sort of lean toward uh, what I call inclusive consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I do, um, and you know, for all intents and purposes, I have fully embraced inclusive language and uh, try to get away from the binary as much as possible. Uh, at the same time, I, I serve a number of people, particularly emerging from historical black churches in, in the South and in up South too. I call up South, you know, the, the black neighborhoods in Chicago and D Detroit and parts of uh, New York and DC, DC too. Um, that just being able to be in an environment that is inclusive of LGBT people and to be able to reclaim uh, the songs and the hymns and the sound of the church that they came from has a healing for a lot of folks, which may mean being able to sing the songs that their mother sang and their grandmother sang and their grandfather sang. And so moving them toward uh, inclusive language in some ways has to have um, give room for time and space. It's kind of like uh, when you had greens that were cooked with ham hocks uh -huh. and then somebody tells you to cook them with smoked turkey <laughs> and then tells you that they taste the same. That's not the truth. <laughs> I can tell you straight out, they do not taste the same. And you have to, your palate has to change. <laughs> a bit to be able to make that huge step <laughs> from ham hocks to smoked turkey. So I think that to some degree, it comes in steps. Mm -hmm. First, it's the fact that they are back in church mm -hmm. and fully affirmed right. as a gay person, as a, as a lesbian, as a, as a transgender person, a gender nonconforming person, and then to be able to talk about. So sometimes we'll sing through a hymn passage the way that it was sung traditionally. Right and then sing it with inclusive language mm -hmm. so that we can in some way move people along to gain back what they have lost first right. mm -hmm. and then move from that to something else that is even greater. Yeah. I will give you a, a, a painful, tortured response. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because, what I was looking for. <laughs> um, so my tradition, of course, is one that goes back uh, not just 2,000 years, but back into, into your territory, right? Um, and it's one of the things that drew me to the Episcopal Church. I grew up in a, in a um, kind of a freestanding church. Um, and to, uh, to say words that have been said for centuries mm -hmm. in exactly the same form mm -hmm. is powerful for me. Uh, it is grounding in a way, and it connects me to all the people who ever said those words and to all the people who ever will say those words. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, um, an ex and, and the one thing I am just downright um, spooky about is the Trinity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like, w there have been people healed with those words and blessed by those words, and challenged by those words. And I, that is just above my pay grade, mm -hmm. to change those words. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I am all for inclusive language pretty much everywhere else, mm -hmm. but I am not messing with that. 
Um, I was in the Solomon Islands. I was doing this 30,000 mile trip around the Pacific Rim visiting mm -hmm. Anglican churches everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I'm in like the most remote place I've ever been in my life. Uh, one of the priests on this island says, uh, my uncle died, would you like to go to a funeral in my village? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yes, let's go. So we drive and then we canoe and then we walk and then we get to this place with um, houses up on stilts because they get tsunamis all the time and uh, they want me to see the body so I climb up into one of the one of the houses and there he is uh, wrapped in banana uh, palm leaves uh, because it holds the moisture in right and they unwrap him for me and then the this priest says to me they want you to pray so, of course, they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. I, haven't heard, I haven't understood a word since we arrived. Um, but so I start praying. And then I'm thinking to myself as I'm praying, well, you're a bishop. Your job is to bless things. So mm -hmm. I figure I'm going to bless, I'm gonna bless the body, mm -hmm. which I do. And I end it with, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and damned if they all didn't cross themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm as far away from home as I will ever be and still be on the planet, mm -hmm. but I'm home, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I am not messing with those words. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, you know, it, it may be sinful on my part and arrogant on my part, mm -hmm. but there is something about that that connects me to the community that, that drew me in um, uh, that I, I can't let go of. Mm -hmm. So it's a... It's a I'm a little tortured about it. Well, well, in the words of the pastor from the little country church I grew up in, there's grace for that. There's what? There's grace for that. Um, thank you all so much. Um, what a wonderful conversation. Um, we'll now turn for a few minutes for questions, if anybody has any. Um, it looks like we've got two mics, one on either side. So if anyone has a question, make your way down. Yes, sorry, <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> um, so I grew up in the Christian faith, um, mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily identify with that anymore. Um, but um, I've seen as LGBTQ acceptance has, has become more popular, um, Christian churches, and I don't know if this is the same for other religions as well, that I almost feel kind of have this wolf in sheep's clothing thing going on, where it's love the hit sinner, hate the sin, I mean, I've even seen churches with rainbow stickers on their front door, but you get in there and it's like, wait, so it's, there's a lot of conditions to this. It's not actually, you know, affirming. Right. So I'm just kind of wondering, and I've seen family members, you know, that will be like, oh, I'm going to this church and they'll like you. And I'm like, mm, yeah, and I'm, I'm just kind of like, um, cautious of that and wondering like, how is that, you know, how are we seeing that play out? Um, is that like, you know, when talking about acceptance and religions, like, is there a portion of people that maybe, you know, are starting to think that they're being accepting, but there's a lot of these conditions to it that really are not affirming and not about what, you know, I'm looking for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please. I hear you. I think it's important for me first to say that I hear you. <laughs> but the other thing I think I'd like to lift up it, like, again, like my brother Gene, I'm, it's a bit dangerous, but I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. I live my life in, in two worlds as it relates to uh, my faith and, and religion and such. I am an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ, which is 80-some percent white church. It is an affirming church in as much as what the General Senate has voted to do, but all of the churches, because it's a congregational polity, um, all of the churches have not, are not affirming. Some of them are welcoming and not affirming. Some of them just say, we don't like y'all, period. It's that kind of, <laughs> but uh, all, in terms of the majority, 
they are affirming. But on the other side of my life, um, I am also um, the, the leader of an organization made up of a number of pr predominantly African-American churches. But not just African-American led, some are not led by uh, black folks, they're led by white folks and other races. And then we are in Asia in several countries. We're also across the continent of Africa. The common denominator is that we are LGBTQI plus throughout our network. And I think one of the reasons I am able to walk with my denomination as it is becoming is because I have a network in my back, <laughs> if that makes sense. I encourage people, if you are involved and engaged in a faith-based organization that is in motion, find a way to also worship with people who have already got this as a common denominator. I believe in entrepreneurial ministry. I believe in creating the change that you want to be in the world, the change you want to see in the world. Sometimes you just have to make it happen. And then on your make it happen side, you're making it happen. And, and it would be emerging, right? Because this is an emerging reality. But simultaneously, I believe in connecting to organizations that have been in place for periods of time. Because there are things to learn about what to do, hallelujah, and what not to do, <laughs> right? that you can learn in those environments. I've lived my life like this for a quarter of a, de of a, a century now, um, and even more so. And then my personal life, my, my spouse and I have been married for 34 years. That's a long time. I got married to the voice of, oh, happy day. You know the song, oh, happy day. That's my wife. <laughs> and I'm saying that, it, and the reason I'm putting it out there is because that home experience is also not just a flash in the pan for me. I believe in the sanctity of my relationship with my partner. I don't judge other people's ways of being together. When I got married, I got married before anybody thought it was the thing to do. And I celebrate the anniversary not of when we got married legally, it's when we got married spiritually. And we got married covenantally. And I'm very grateful. So those things working together inform the other. I encourage people, don't throw all of those eggs into one basket. It's a good thing to have several different kinds of things buoying you up as you are seeking to hear and understand spiritually where it is that God in spirit intends to place you in life. Thank you for asking that important question. Yes. Over here. Came here tonight to get a little bit of inspiration. Uh, so I think that there is something profoundly spiritual about the coming out experience. And those of us who have uh, done it, um, know what that feels like. Um, there is a coming out experience that I keep turning to uh, in, the, in the book of Exodus, uh, where God is speaking out of the burning bush and tells Moses God's name, um, uh, which gets translated a number of different ways, but I, I am what I am, or just I am, which doesn't mean a lot, except that there is a, an astounding vulnerability on God's part. Everybody talks about God being all-powerful. As I read scripture, God is all vulnerable yeah. in tons of ways. And so I think that LGBTQ people um, are spiritual in a special way uh, because we have to come out and declare ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
and, and that that is uh, uh, an experience that transcends uh, any particular brand of Christianity or flavor, um, and it's something that, that we all share. I actually think that, that that experience, that there's something about that experience that is like whatever it is at the center of the universe. And, and so we come, and, and when, when God says to Moses, take your damn shoes off, this is holy ground. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody's ever come out to you, you know what that feels like, right? You just want to take your shoes off. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't believe someone is entrusting themselves to you in that moment, in that way. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are ways of talking about that with, without necessarily bringing God into it. Uh, uh, but I think it brings us, uh, in, that is an inherently spiritual experience. And um, I don't know how that you know, relates to particular work, except that I think our community would be better off if we could name that for what it is, which is a, which is a powerful spiritual experience, and honor it in, in whatever, whatever way. And I think, too, we can't just be people of faith working in faith organizations, or LGBT people working in LGBT organizations, or Jews working with Jews and Muslims working with Muslims. Otherwise, it's just a whole different kind of um, separateness. And, and that's not how change happens. And that's not, um, that's not how big institutions and organizations and corporations and government become more inclusive and more affirming. So thank you for doing whatever it is you do, wherever it is you do it, um, for the good of all of us and everyone that we are fighting for and with. I got a pearl for you, John. It's, here's my pearl. In the, in the creation story, in Eden, right? The creation story, or creation myth, however we see it, says that Eve was made from Adam's rib, which suggests to me that Adam had a whole woman living inside of it. Yes. <laughs> I, I thought about it the other day. I said, that's pretty good. <laughs> I said, God had it worked out from the very beginning. I just wanted to let you know. Be blessed. Brother. So we have about five minutes left. So. All right. There we go. This is on. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, good evening. Um, Victoria Kirby York. I'm with the National LGBTQ Task Force. I want to thank you all for being here. And, and out of the bottom of my heart, thank all of you. Um, when we dreamed up pulling this together, I, I shared this with the panelists. We literally said your four names, and all four of them said yes. And I'm so grateful. This conversation is even more beautiful than we could have imagined. Um, the question that I have. Um, we've recently uh, launched a campaign around the Equality Act and federal non-discrimination protections called um, All of Me All the Time. And something about both mm -hmm. something you said, Bishop Blunder and Bishop uh, Robinson, around the, the way it landed on me was being your, your true self, your full self is sacred. Mm -hmm. There's a freedom and liberation that comes from being able to walk holy. And I heard that in some of what you were saying, Bishop Blender, about these both ex these experiences and how you need both of them to be whole in some ways. And so I, I just wanted uh, to see what you all thought about, um, particularly being in both progressive spaces, queer spaces, faith spaces, spaces where we're often asked to be one and not all. How do you kind of live your life and how can you, how have, how are, can you be seen as models for all of us and how we live our lives as whole, entire folks without kind of feeling the, the pull, push and pull around identities? Yeah, um, for me, it's been the LGBTQ Muslim community. Um, without them and without uh, knowing that, that I have that, it would have been really hard. Uh, I've been... Um, when I first came out, um, you know, I wasn't sure how Islam fit into any of that, and it took me a long time to come and find my community, and um, it's, and that to me is everything. Um, and when I started becoming more involved with the sort of the mainstream Muslim um, civil rights spaces, for example, uh, 
you know, that was really hard because I was not always welcome there, but I fought to be there. But at the end of the day, I knew that I had this other community, that my whole community, that I could be, could, that they, that they, they got me um, and that I could, I could go back to that. And so, um, but I also want to fight to be in my community, in my Muslim community, because at the end of the day, that's where people are really struggling and not finding home. And that's a lot of where the trauma is coming from for a lot of our young people, our young Muslim LGBTQ youth. Um, so that's really important work. But at the end of the day, I need to go home to my community and that really, that really helps. And I know some of the folks are here. Thanks, Palmer. <laughs> right over here, quickly. Hi, um, I'm Amanda. It's been a rough couple of months, um, especially, but really a rough couple of years to be a United Methodist, yeah. um, especially for my friends who are queer United Methodists. Why shouldn't they just leave? Why should they remain United Methodist? And for my millennial aged friends who are seeking ordination in the United Methodist Church, why should they not just leave and become Episcopalian or United Church of Christ or mm -hmm. join a denomination that's already done all of the work? Why should we stay? Uh, so I'll, I'll say two things. Uh, one is don't threaten to leave, threaten to stay. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's your church, too. If somebody else has to leave because they can't stomach you, you know, don't let the door hit you on the way out. But don't you leave, right? Um, I think there is, there is something um, empowering about, about uh, claiming this thing that has been a part of your life for so long. I would, I would say that. Um, unless it's tearing you apart spiritually and, and, and is doing more harm than good. But uh, just to, to uh, slink away I don't think solves anything. The other thing that I, I know is that the essence of, of um, civil disobedience is enough good people break a law that it becomes untenable to punish that many good people, right? I mean, that's how it works, right? And only a few people break the law, then, then they get screwed. But if a lot of people do, at some point, it it becomes uh, impossible to punish all of them. So you've got Foundry Church up here, who, which is uh, big, uh, yeah. rich, and powerful. You know, it's sort of like the, the national cathedral of the, of the Methodist Church. And they've been marrying people and doing all kinds of great stuff. Mm -hmm. but, that, but the little Methodist place in Idaho is, you know, out there. So, you know, I said to them, you, you need to spread some of your money around and help some of these people in these smaller congregations uh, to be brave and to, to claim this church as your own. And, uh, and I, uh, enough people have to do it so it becomes uh, impossible uh, to be, I mean, I don't know. That's cool. But don't leave. <laughs> I, w I would. I mean, the, out of our experience in the Episcopal Church, we said this is our church too. If you got to leave, God love you, but we're not leaving. And a hundred thousand did, out of two million. Now that's a lot of people, and that's really sad. But why should we have left? Thank you. And last question. My name is Kenneth Jost. I'm a journalist. I cover the Supreme Court. We have a second gay wedding cake case in the pipeline uh, for the justices to decide whether they're going to hear that one. And uh, I'd like to hear your respective thoughts as, pe as people of faith, whether LGBT groups are pressing too hard against those who claim a religious exemption from the civil rights laws that protect, among others, LGBT rights uh, people. Is, is, is it wise or unwise to keep up that fight, in your view? I don't think there's any other option than keeping up the fight. I think 
um, I think you were saying before, you know, we, the hearts and minds work won't necessarily happen in a court decision. Um, but I, I think, it, and you know, my organization joins legal briefs and joins briefs in um, LGBTQ equality cases, particularly saying when a religious freedom argument is made as a reason to not provide civil rights for all, that we as people of faith, and, and there are many faith organizations who join these briefs, say this is not what our religion uh, can and should be used for, and this is not what religious freedom means. And so I think that pushing for full equality is our only option. Um, and if we believe that people should not be denied service at a business because of what they look like or who they pray to or whether or not they pray at all, then they cannot and should not be denied service because of who they want to marry or because of their gender identity. And I fully support um, autonomy and, and rights within religious communities, right? We're never going to tell a house of worship whether or not they should or must ordain, uh, c you know, perform same-sex marriages. In the same way, we're also unfortunately not going to uh, get into intra-community um, determinations of interracial or interfaith marriages. But civil marriage is different, and civil rights and our, our civil laws are also different. Um, and so when somebody opens a business, they have to serve all. And that's, that's how we maintain our pluralistic society. That's how we are a pluralistic democracy where everybody gets to be who they are. And so I think that we do need to contend with the hearts and minds work as we keep pushing forward. But I think pushing forward is our only option. Let me just add to that. So I agree with that 100%. What I'm going to say is after that, after that is secure, mm -hmm. is that uh, I think our side needs to understand that for whatever reasons, uh, and reasons that w we wouldn't like if we even heard them, uh, this is problematic for people who are of, of certain faiths. And I think we need to take that seriously. And the other side needs to understand that this has nothing to do with wedding cakes and everything to do with respect. Mm -hmm. I mean, Aretha Franklin got it right, right? Mm -hmm. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Yeah. Like, this, this is just one of the indications that the society respects us as a member of that society. And I think, um, I think this has to be the law and then we'll all be better off if, if, if we take a humility pill and realize that the other side is saying something that means a lot to them and that this is, neither side is doing this on a lark and that we would, I mean, I would wanna, I would not want a wedding cake that I forced a baker to bake like, what a lousy thing to have at your reception, right? So, but, um, but I'd like the baker to know that, that I, I get his or her discomfort with this. I, I do. I think they'll get somewhere else because I think we're all going somewhere else. Uh, but it'll take a while. And um, we're not just trying to be difficult. We're, we're trying to gain a measure of respect in this culture uh, that we've been denied for a very, very long time. And if both sides could, um, I think, acknowledge the, uh, the, uh, the power of this uh, dilemma, both sides, uh, we, would, we would begin to come back together a bit. Well, that is it for this evening. Thank you all so much for coming out, and thank you again to our panelists. And I hope you all have a great night. Thank you.